some of the challenges that we have ahead, we need to produce more food. We need to produce half again what we're producing now by 2050. So other civilizations, or other uh, countries like our lifestyle, and they want to be able to live our lifestyle, so it's going to take more food to do that. We'll have to produce that food on declining land area. Currently, we're losing soils at 10 times the rate of formation in the US and Australia. And India and China are losing it from 30 to 40 times that rate. Now, in the US, when we first colonized, there was about 18 inches of topsoil in the US. Currently, there's eight inches average in the US. We also need to grow this food on soils that are continually being degraded. We have salinization, salinization we have uh, desertification, we, some of the chemicals and nutrients that we're adding to our soils are making them toxic, and we're also losing land to land development. We'll have to do this using less water, because currently about 21 of the 37 aquifers in the world are being depleted faster than they can be replenished. We'll also have to do that with fewer energy and natural resources. In the past, our oil exploration gave us oil that yielded 100 units of energy for every unit of energy that we had to take to get it out of the ground. The oil that we're finding now can take 25 units. We only, we only yield 25 units of energy for every unit of energy we put into it. So the energy return on investment on our new oil and gas supplies is much more energy expensive. The tar sands, we're looking at about three to one. Any soybean or diesel oils are about 1.3 to one. Our lifestyles require 30 to one. If you're around the 10 to one energy return on investment ratio, you're living lifestyle like in North Korea. So all this we have to do with these many problems, plus in a system with higher economic risk for farmers and ranchers. Our income over the last, since 1960, is about similar to what it is today. Our debt is much higher, so our leverage, what used to be an average of two to one, is now over three to one. With all those problems, we're looking for some simple answers. Answers that we can employ, answers that are practical. What we'll have to rely on is the microbiology in the soil, is what I'm seeing in my research. So microbes have been integral in shaping this planet for the last four billion years. You can see four billion years ago, bacteria showed up on the scene in the, the fossil record. About 3.5 billion years ago, they developed the process of photosynthesis, able to capture energy from the sun, store that energy, and use it for making more microbes. That changed the future of this planet. It's a living planet, and that simple adaptation by microbes makes everything we have here possible today. It created an event, a great oxygenation event, Whereas if you were an anaerobe at that time, you saw that as a bad thing. But it gave way to us being able to start to, uh, fungi to be able to adapt to the system. You brought on your ozone layer, which gave us protection for what life forms that have formed on this planet. Your first single cell animals came along about 750 million years ago. And in the fossil record we see Glomer micata, this is the mycorrhizal fungi. These are the fungi that associate with the plant and help a plant capture all the nutrients it needs in exchange for energy from the plant. At the same time, land plants came up in the fossil record. It's probably not a coincidence since they work together. And then finally, us, we're the new kids on the block, and we get to reap all the benefits of this. This is a chart for the last 590 million years. It gives you what the oxygen content in the atmosphere was, what the CO2 content on this axis. It gives you the temperature 
that we currently have, or that we had over this period. We are here now. We are here at probably the best time that this planet has seen. We're about 11 degrees centigrade. We have a CO2 concentration, about 400 parts per million. We have adequate oxygen. Now, how microbes have changed and how life has changed the CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere over this period. You can see we're about 7,000, up to about 7,000 parts per million back 505 million years ago. In the Cambrian explosion, when we saw corals and shelled animals increase in the ocean, you can see that event started to push the atmospheric CO2 down because they were capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and it would be absorbed in the ocean and they would take it and make shells. The first land plants and the first fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi, came along about here about 500 million years ago. You can see that adaptation or that change in efficiency of capture energy from the sun started to do a decrease there. Lignin, vascular plants, came along about a little over 400 million years ago in the Silurian. During the Devonian, you see eight meter tall fungi. Progymnosperms, roots and leaves. All these are increased adaptations for capturing energy and in that, that energy gets stored as a carbon element, as sugars or as plant matter. About 300 million years ago, during the Carboniferous period, this is the period that most all the coal formed on this planet, you can see we had a cooling and a collapse of the rainforest, but we still had a significant amount of photosynthesis going on to capture and store all the energy that's in the carbon that we are harvesting today. The reason that we had that buildup of carbon, there was no lignin degrading microbes before that period. So that biomass did not break down. It just stacked up and stacked up and stacked up till we have the colds that we have today. Along came lignin degrading microbes. You see an increase in CO2, atmospheric CO2. And all these extinction events were also, you can see they have an effect on CO2. But angiosperms, the next increase in uh, the evolutionary chain, you can see they were more efficient at capturing carbon. You see it go down. And finally, we see a cooling period, landmass positioning mammals, but most importantly, we see ungulates or grazing animals. They are the source of the soils we have today because of all the evolutionary adaptations that accompanied them in this process. What we need to look at on the planet is all life forms that have evolved on this planet are superorganisms. They depend on a microbial community that they associate with for their survival. We as the human organism, we have about 10 trillion cells in our body. We have 100 trillion microbes. So we're outnumbered 10 to 1 microbe to our cell count. We have about 30,000 genes in our DNA. Our microbial complement has about 8 million genes. So we are not individuals, we are ecosystems. Our well-being depends on our microbial population, its structure, and the biological functionality of this microbiome. So this human superorganism, these, or, these microbes help us digest our food, generate nutrients for us, synthesize vitamins, break down xenobiotics, detoxify carcinogens, promote cell renewal, activate and support our immune system, control our appetites and cravings, alter immune system development, promoting and avoiding allergic disorders, prevent asthma and skin diseases in infants, turn on and off our genes in our body that, that control brain development, anxiety, depression, autism, arthritis, and emotional behavior. Do you feel like you're really in control on this? If disturbed, 
these functions can be compromised. One good example of this is Crohn's disease. The simple regime of antibiotics can compromise your stomach biota, and another organism can come in and fill the niche that that, that antibiotic has cleaned out, and it uh, can be a very chronic disease. Crohn's disease, many people suffer years on this. They lose massive amounts of weight. They ha can have resections of their intestines to try to cure this. They can also have antibiotic regimes again. But what they found out is a simple fecal transplant from a healthy host, bringing that microbiota back into the system can cure people within 24 hours. And they get these cures in 90 plus percent of the people that undergo these. So if the human microbiome can be fixed this easily, can we do this in our soils too? And I hope to show you that we can. So plants are no different from us. They depend on their microbial counterpart and they are also outnumbered many times, probably more than what we are with ours. They depend on them for nutrient acquisition, pathogen protection, and gene regulation, and many other things that we're probably not even aware of yet. This is Elaine Ingham's uh, theory on plant succession relative to the microbial community structure in a soil. She is talking about fungal to bacterial ratio, or the biomass of fungi in a soil, to the biomass of bacteria. It's a very simple pers perspective on this, but it seemed to have some weight when you start to do the studies on it and the analysis that I've done. In a bacterial soil, this is where you have a bare soil parent material. Bacteria are the ones that are starting to break this soil down and change the structure. As you increase fungal to bacterial ratio up this ladder, you start to get cyanobacteria, true bacteria, protozoa, fungi, and nematodes. As you'll see, these, these will be very important for cycling the nutrients that are, will be made available to the plant. Uh, at a fungal to bacterial ratio of 0.1, weeds. Now, weeds are a misnomer. Weeds have a purpose in a soil. And you can often tell the healthier soil by the weeds that are growing in it. You can tell, like you have a fire in a forest, the first plant that's coming in there is uh, fireweed. It has a function in bringing that soil back. Also, in the desert, in our area, if you scarify it, tumbleweeds will pop up. But you don't know. The seeds are in the desert, and we notice that tumbleweeds will only grow for about three years. They go away, but the seeds are still there. But they've changed the soil, so the next plant that comes in to improve the soil can function. This happens all the way up this ladder. As you go, you go up the ladder, you start early grasses, bromus and bermuda, your mid grasses and your vegetables at one to one, our late successional grasses and row crops. Agriculture is controlled disturbance. What we want to do is keep the productive level of the soil and the fungal to bacterial ratio of that soil in this range. We are here right now. Most of our soils are mostly bacterial dominant. And that's where we need to be. In rangeland, this is your control disturbance. These are the tools that you use to keep at that place on the ladder that you have the most productive capacity. Now in cropland, I have to mimic this guy. They're out there, they're breaking up the soil structure with their hooves. They're also out there, they will keep it all pruned down. If you don't keep, leave them too long, they'll prune it down just enough and you'll get enough biomass back in the soil to start feeding the microbes. So I have to mimic this, I have to mow my crops on my, my process. I will disc them in to simulate the hooves, pushing this organic matter in to, to feed this, the microbiome. Also, 
these cows are continually inoculating the soil as they eat, either through the uh, manure that they spread or even through the saliva that they have. They can, they're inoculating these soils with the microbes that need to be there. I have to mimic that, so my wife and I developed a composting process in a project with USDA. It had to do with, they had the problem with dairy waste that is very saline. You're talking about from 30 to 44 millisiemens salinity. Plants can't take, most plants can't take anything over 10, and a lot of plants can't take anything over three. And the compost that they had been producing for the decade before I got this project ended up to be just as saline as the, what they started with and even more saline. So they concluded in that decade that composts were bad for soils. And they were probably correct because they were using an immature compost. Now this composter is a static process. I'll go through the process later of how to build it. But it ended up giving us a composting process that used less water, about six times less water in the desert. It reduced composting time by about 66%. It resulted in a low salinity compost, about two to three millisiemens. It's amenable to vermicomposting or adding worms into the process after you get through the thermic fillet phase or the, hot, the, uh, the high temperature phase. But most importantly, what we got out of this, it produced a high quality, nutrient rich, fungal dominated compost. And without this composting process, this static process, we could not have explored how increasing the fungal community in a soil will affect plant growth. Mm -hmm.